टू वन सर वी आर लाइव नाउ uh okay good evening everybody welcome again to this evening's webinar uh, brought to you from the orthopedic research and education foundation uh, being relayed through ortho tv uh, today we have the pleasure of having dr ritab mithal from spinal injuries hospital new delhi uh, ritab is a very very keen teacher and has been involved with the ao for many years and it will be a pleasure to listen to him today he is going to talk about biomechanics of implants basically for implants used in fracture fixation so over to you ritab thank you sir thank you for the kind words and uh, it's an honor to be part of the association and uh, welcome participants and it may sound a little intimidating but we will go through some of the meanings of the words that are commonly used in mechanics and in terms of implant we know that there is stainless steel and titanium so we'll briefly talk about what we have to what are the salient differences between them we'll discuss a few clinical cases to apply the mechanical knowledge that we have learned during the course of this presentation in the clinical cases and i would be interested in learning from your questions so coming to the first word we talk of strength of a material strength of the implant by strength we mean the ability of a material to withstand loading without failure so we have seen so many ipl games cricket around the world we rarely see the bat breaking and that is what happens in orthopedics too sometimes things happen so the ability of a material to withstand loading repetitively without failure what is failure in terms of orthopedics failure means a change in the shape of the device it could be a plate it could be a nail so in this case we see a stem a femur stem on the top of the image during the surgery the patient had an iatrogenic fracture the staples are still visible the fix fracture was fixed but the plate has started deforming within 10 days of fixation so this is failure so this tells us that the strength of the implant was not sufficient failure on the other hand could mean break in the implant which we more commonly see the second term we talk of is stiffness of the implant stiffness means the ability of a implant or material to resist deformation as you can see this high speed image of a tennis ball hitting the racket there is a deformation in the racket cutting as well as in a change in the shape of the bone of the ball so all devices when they interact with each other do deform a little sometimes it is visible sometimes it is not so visible so this is an implant fixed to the tibial bone in a minimally invasive manner in a bridge mode and on your right is the implant fixed to the femur bone similarly in a bridge mode the working length of both the implants is the same but the tibial plate has deformed so the stiffness of the tibial plate was much less compared to the femur plate so when we talk of the two words we have so far learned loading and deformation this is a classical example in real this is a classical example in real life of a car tire which is on loading you see the tire it has deformed so this is what usually happens in real life also on a scale that is much less visible to the naked eye but is appreciable by the biological cells and tissues and their response over time is what we interpret on images now coming to loading loading is also a force 
the synonym for force is also stress. Now, these forces or stresses could either be static or dynamic or repetitive. So when we talk of biomechanics to understand things, we talk first in terms of static stresses, that is axial stresses, bending and torsion or twisting stresses. But what happens in real life is that all these forces are acting in combination together. The contribution of the various forces may vary. We will come to that in the subsequent clinical examples. Sometimes we see pure spiral fractures. Sometimes we see spiral fracture with three, four fragments. It means that the initial contribution of the spiral force was probably more, but then axial compression caused the fragmentation of the bone. So now we will take each force. So this is example of a loading or axial force. So axial forces tend to lengthen or shorten the bone. So this is a multifragmentary fracture. If not splinted by a material or a plate, you can now see that the limb is shortening or lengthening on functional loading. Sometimes the limbs shorten. As you can see, the bones overriding, sometimes they lengthen. So axial forces essentially mean they tend to shorten or lengthen the bone. Next is bending. Bending forces tend to angulate the fracture. Bending forces tend to angulate the fracture as seen in this example. So you can see a five-year-old boy who has been, whose fra fracture femur plates, even the adult plate failed, possibly due to reasons that we'll understand as we progress in our presentation. And bending forces tend to angulate the fracture angulation, as you can see in the examples here. The third load or stress that we talk of is torsion. Torsion forces, as the word implicates, tends to twist the fracture. So as you can see in this presentation video, fracture fragments are twisting on loading. These tend to cause rotatory mal displacements. So rotation is something that is better appreciated clinically, radiologically. But in this presentation, if you see, proximally the plate and the screws are visible in profile, but distally, the distal femur and proximal tibia seem to have rotated out of place. So rotation is a uh, displacement better appreciated appreciated clinically. So we are now aware of the three loading forces that we have seen. Now we talk of deformation. Deformation means change in shape. Change in shape, it could be a change in length like the tennis ball, it changed in shape from round to a little oval. The car tire flattened out a little bit. Change in shape is called strain in mechanical terms. So this is an elastic band the lady is exercising and it's changing in length and coming back to its original length. So we now introduce another term of elasticity, ability to deform and then regain the original shape. So let's take a break here. So we now we have covered the strength of an implant, the stiffness of an implant, the same Definitions apply to strength of bone, stiffness of bone, and deformation of bone. So this is a video made in 1968 showing what happens to bone when it is axially little bent and torsion applied. So all the three forces applied to a dog femur. This is a 40 second video and please just observe it. There. This is a slow motion 
showing how bone has fractured and now once you reverse the video you will see how we can reduce it this is naked bone the soft tissues in fact reduce the displacement of the fracture if the soft tissues weren't there these fractures would have flown out so this is the kind of injury and this is what happens in a microsecond in real life so coming to stress strain relationship you all must have seen this diagram this graph so a is the elastic zone when the load is removed the material regains its original shape so when we run we walk we jump our bones ever so lightly deform in shape but we are ready for the next step or the next jump because the bone is elastic within a certain limit similarly implants are elastic within a certain limit c is known as the yield point beyond c when the load is removed the structure or material does not come back to its original length a certain amount of deformation is inevitable so this is known as the limit beyond which plant is now working in its plastic region as an example here so the femur was plated and within 2 weeks the deformation began so the implant is now not going to restore or regain its original length it will stay deformed so on functional loading of this limb muscle contraction the deformation will markedly increase with a slight increase in stress as can be seen from this graph a slight increase in stress causes a marked increase in deformation so this is doomed to fail this fixation because the implant is now in its plastic region so we'll take the stress strain relationship of four different materials seen here so if we see the blue line the blue line shows that on high stresses there is very very little deformation very little deformation but the moment there is deformation there is no further line it means that the material just breaks so this material blue line material is very strong very stiff but suddenly breaks so an example here is glass the red line is also strong also stiff and deforms a little but then breaks so its ductility or resistance to failure or the plastic deformation zone is very less this is titanium the green line is strong has good strength has good stiffness but has a wide plastic zone so it is a ductile material it stretches out gives some time before it breaks catastrophically this is stainless steel and the purple deforms very much given very little stress it just deforms so this is polyethylene or something like rubber it has no ductility it has too much of ductility but it has no inherent strength in itself so we can't make implants out of polyethylene although the drive is on to find out implants which do not need surgery to get removed for small bones but they don't have any strength or stiffness now i will like to introduce you to a word moment like a moment in time this is in physics a moment 
मोमेंट इज अ टाइप ऑफ फोर्स द ओनली डिफरेंस इज द फोर्स लाइक दिस जेंटलमैन टाइटनिंग द नट ऑन द स्पोक अ फोर्स दैट चेंजेस मोमेंट मोमेंट्स आर आइदर इन बेंडिंग दीज रोटेटरी सीन इन बेंडिंग स्ट्रेसेस और इन टॉर्शनल स्ट्रेसेस लोडिंग ऑफ द बोन सो टू टेक अ ब्रीदर we have understood what the strength of a material is that how much load it will take before it fails stiffness is how much will it resist deformation loading forces are axial bending and torsional we have understood the relation of stress and strain and we have been introduced to the word moment which is a type of force that changes its direction as it is applied so how does a structure resist deformation how does an implant resist deformation how does someone or something resist deformation the sumo wrestler resist deformation simply by the body weight his mass what we call inertia the heavier he is the better he will be able to resist any push so let me take you through the example of someone pushing a car if this were a truck two people would not have been able to do it this is a car so the two people may be able to push it so the concept of resistance or inertia is simple in when thought of pushing in a straight line you have to push some object it's understandable intuitively you have to push and the heavier it is the stronger it the more force you will require to push it now think about this man philip petit walking the line a very famous picture made on this gentleman who walked across the twin towers so he is trying to resist movement not primarily in the forward direction in the rotatory direction so that he doesn't fall off so how does an object resist deformation in rotation yes the mass does matter but if you see this gentleman apart from the mass he has moved his arms away from the body what does this do and in the previous example you saw philip petty he was carrying a rod a long rod in his hand so what does moving the hands away from the body do it basically changes the distribution of the mass so this is a concept to understand that it is not only mass distributed from the center that prevents deformation in the rotation so what has nature done with this concept to make you understand this we'll go through an example here this is a 23 year old lady's bone fixed femur fracture fixed with a nail and this is a 83 year old lady whose fracture is about to be fixed so what you can see in the young lady is a thick cortex what you can see in the elderly lady is a thinner cortex if you keep try to push in a nail in a young lady the maximum we can go up to is a 9 or 10 mm nail but in elderly 11 12 nail also goes in so why has this happened how has nature understood this concept and applied it to the human body with aging as the amount of bone is reducing nature distributes it further from the central axis away from the neutral zone of the bone away from the bone so that given the same amount of mass the wider it is the 
structure strength of the bone can be better another example of nature using this concept of distribution of mass away from the center is in a callus or healing bone as you can see in this x-ray you can see callus an earlier x-ray of this healing bone shows a cauliflower like callus so the diameter of the callus is much more than the diameter of the bone the initial callus is made up of soft callus so the material is soft but as it is distributed further from the center the complex of callus and the bone together can resist the deformation much better and as the callus starts getting harder and the bone starts maturing you will see that the callus starts narrowing and in final stages of remodeling the bone restores its original shape so nature too uses this concept of distribution of mass away from the center to reduce deformation of healing bone coming to the second learning outcome of stainless steel versus titanium if we can see the strength the strength is the same almost the same megapascals is the strength unit is megapascals and the resistance to deformation is significantly higher almost 1000 times higher if you see the stiffness of stainless steel it is double that of titanium so it needs much more loading to deform compared to titanium if we compare this to the stiffness of original cortical bone cortical bone has a stiffness of only 20 gpa and cancellous bone has an even lesser stiffness the problem is these are all static values in real life most of the stresses are cyclical like the rocks shaped along the sea shore by the waves over years thousands and billions of years similarly once a fracture is fixed with an implant the implant and bone complex are subjected to repetitive cyclical axial bending and torsional stresses from the very next moment that the patient comes out of anesthesia muscle forces act even if the patient is bedridden and they act in different directions and the bone and the fixation is loaded from the moment patient is out of anesthesia so we'll take an example to compare stainless steel and titanium so this is a proximal femur fracture fixed with a dcs and in 3 months you can see something the implant is well fixed but the shape of the implant has started changing this is a fracture femur fixed with a titanium plate a titanium plate gives no time it just breaks so this happened to the gentleman's left femur 6 months down the line the patient had a bilateral shaft femur fracture had bilateral plating the left side broke at 6 months we fixed it the left and the right side broke at 18 months so this is stainless steel it gives you some opportunity to in understand and at uh challenge and tackle the problem before titanium just gives way so both are strong stainless steel is stiffer but stainless steel has more ductility it gives a zone of breathing to act before catastrophic failure coming to clinical cases this is a 1 2 a3 a transverse fracture in mid shaft humerus as you can see at 2 weeks this is the fracture gap this is at 6 weeks this is 16 weeks and this is a year so nature has followed all the principles of physics 
and mechanics and the patient has a beautiful functional outcome. Now, in our eagerness to return outcomes, we marry metal to the bone. So, this is another example of a humerus fracture and a plate has been fixed and a plaster slab has been given. So, the metal and bone now have to stay married. So, this is three months. This is five months. And this is eight months. Divorce. So, what went wrong? When we didn't do anything, as we say, conservative treatment, the bone went on to unite. And when we fixed a plate, the bone became happy. So, did the bone become unhappy or did we make it unhappy? So, the usual reasons the patients are generally given and this young gentleman came up with and I made a note of all them are reasons which cannot be objectively explained. Implant quality poor, it is just poisoning the mind of the patient against the previous doctor. Patient bone quality is not so good. How can a 20-year-old boy's bone quality not be good? Yeah, it may not be good if you were taking steroids for some other ailment, but it was not the case. Plaster was removed too early. Surgery was done wrong, but what was wrong done wrong, not explained. Nailing would have been better. Plates are not put in this kind of case. Started Patient started doing things he shouldn't have been doing, like doing dumbbells or combing his hair. Did the patient fall back again? Calcium tablets were not started. So these are reasons of a given of not a rational, logical mind. These are emotional reasons. A more analytical mind will think of what may have happened to the bone vascularity during surgery. Was the limb being loaded excessively? So try to find out what kind of activities he was doing once he was comfortable. Were there high strain conditions? And what was the material property that was used? So now you know, because this failed slowly without any deformation, this must have been a titanium implant. So we will talk of this concept, high strain conditions. And to understand this, you must all read the strain theory of Perrin. So what is this strain theory of Perrin? The strain theory tells us that human bone, animal bone, the tissues after fracture or even before otherwise forearm is x-ray. Dominant right hand dominant tennis player like no forearm is x-rayed right versus left, his right side bone, forearm bone, will be bigger in size. The cortices will be thicker and the bones will be much stronger. So, tissue is forming in response to the mix. Because something in the bone detects motion and that something is the osteocyte with its caniculi interacting with each other, osteocytes sense motion. When they sense motion, they transfer or convert this mechanical signal to chemical reactions, concept known as mechanotransduction. Reactions then help form bone or lies or death destroy the bone. So the osteocyte, which is the most abundant cell in the human bone or animal bone, is a mechanosensor which senses motion and converts that into chemical stresses, chemical reactions. So the strain theory of parents says that say the two cylinders are broken bone ends and you can see six cell column in between them. 
So say this fracture length is L. When the bone is loaded in tension, you can see a change in the shape of the cells. So there is an increase in the length of the fracture gap. So change in length over the original length multiplied by 100 is the strain. That is how we calculate the strain. So let us take two examples. This is a one cell thick gap between the two broken ends. And this is a four cell thick gap between the two broken ends. So if we calculate the strain at the four cell thick layer, if on stretching the cell thickness, the fracture gap has increased by one. So one upon four, the strain is effectively 25%. But if the fracture gap is only one cell thick and it has increased, so the strain on the healing cell is 100%. So if the fracture gap is small, the strain environment is very high on healing tissues. And if the fracture gap is more, then the strain environment is less on healing tissues. So this is a concept and this is a fact now. Bone forms when the strain is less than 2%. Cartilage forms when the strain is around 10% on healing mesenchymal tissue and granulation tissue forms when the strain is 100%. So if there is too much motion at the fracture site, a pseudarthrosis will form and we say it's a fibrous non-union. With time, that fibrous tissue gradually gets converted to cartilage. So we will see cartilage at the ends of the bone, but bone never bridges across. So it becomes a non-union. So this diagram was explained by Powell almost 100 years ago. He said, whatever the stresses and whatever the along a certain path, and eventually, if the mechanical cartilage will convert into bone, and fibrous tissue can also get converted into bone. So this is the concept of so now understood. And I will take you through clinical examples. So strain tolerance in this conservatively managed humeral fracture. There was a large fracture. So the strain on the healing tissues was low bone callus. On the other hand, the strain tolerance in this small fracture gap was very high. Absolute stability, this was relative stability. So there was micro motion. This micro motion created high strain on healing tissue. When there is high strain on healing tissue, healing tissue the chances of granulation tissue forming will be higher. And this is eventually what led to poor bone healing. A clinical example, this is a spiral fracture of the proximal femur with some fragmentation. The surgeon opted for absolute stability, but there are certain fracture gaps visible. It created a high strain condition and eventually this happened. So if you see this critically, the spiral fracture has disappeared and the non-union is now fundamentally transverse. So all multi-fragmentary fractures when fixed and when they eventually go into non-union, eventually are left with a single fracture line. So when there are multiple fracture lines, the strain is distributed over multiple areas but as the fracture fragments start uniting, the strain concentration starts getting higher and higher. So a simple a spiral fracture became a transverse non-union. 
you have understood bending forces torsional forces axial forces you have understood strain you have understood this deformation but with plates another unique phenomena happens like you can see in this diagram here the strain is the red triangle so when a plate is applied on one side of the bone the strain under the plate on the side of the plate is almost negligible so bone may form there because the deformation is much less but on the side opposite where the strain is higher there is no bone formation there is granulation tissue formation and that's how the implant on cyclical loading starts bending and deforming so to summarize broken bone is programmed to heal we as surgeons can modify the healing environment we must customize the mechanics to the requirement of the fracture not to what we know and whatever we do we must try to avoid high strain conditions in any fracture fixation thank you thank you thank you very much open to questions thank you very much ritab uh, as you. usual you have this ability to break down things into very simple uh, format so that people can understand and i'm sure if there are any questions uh, the participants would be happy to ask them and i'm sure ritab will be happy to answer them so over to the questions from the participants anything in the chat so uh, right now we have not but you can uh, uh, stop sharing your screen ritab stop sharing your yes, screen yeah, great yes, sir yeah thank you sir thank you very much so uh, i have gone through the question paper there are few question uh, like one thing they repeatedly asked about uh, bio absorbable implants so how it is different yeah. from the normal ones the bio absorbable bio, bio absorbable implants basically like uh, vicryl is an absorbable suture polyglycolic acid polylactic acid so we have implants made of those materials we had plates and k wires for use in pediatric patients for finger fractures they came up in a big way the benefit was that there is no need for a repeat surgery for removal but the problem is all the bio absorbable implants start degrading in the corrosive saline environment of the body so they start losing their strength and stiffness but if the fracture has not healed appropriately in 6 weeks and the implant has become weak the fracture fixation will fail also some of them had this uh, uh, tendency to produce granulomatous reactions and but the newer generation ones are better for that yes use some of these k wires and uh, things both in pediatrics and in fractures Yeah. they they heal have a potential for faster healing like we've like finger there. fractures these thing have merit there so uh, another thing they have asked about the guiding principle of implant removal so sir what we find for like titanium implants it's difficult to remove yes so uh, my another question which i want to ask uh, is like if we can put the steel screw which is not usually done so that may be little easier so no, that's a very wonder wonderful thought it's a very wonderful thought to use a titanium plate and stainless steel screw that is actually a wonderful thought so yes there is some galvanic corrosion that may happen between because of movement of metal so this is not something that is recommended that you can mix and match but the corrosion phenomena is negligible this can be done and stainless steel screws are far easier to remove so it's a very novel concept very interesting but we cannot um, recommend it as a routine or something that should be done in clinical practice titanium is a nightmare because because of titanium's less ductility 
the moment the handle is turned the screw driver is turned either the screw will break titanium is softer than stainless steel so the heads deform the plus side of titanium is it's easier to cut cut through using a burr hole drill you can burr the head of the titanium screw much easier than stainless steel stainless steel removal is um, uh, broken screw is a bigger challenge than a titanium broken but stainless steel generally comes out quicker yeah uh, there is one question sir we have asked about uh, to reduce the strain the fracture gap should be less he is asking about the question no, no. after yeah. to reduce strain on healing tissue the fracture gap should be more that is what nature does so whenever there is a fracture we will see a fracture line on day one suppose we manage it conservatively four six weeks later we see that the fracture gap has widened that is what nature does so the cells at the zone of fracture undergo cell death because of loss of blood supply so nature during conservative treatment widens the fracture gap so widening of that fracture gap reduces the strain on the healing tissue so that is the that is what happened in the humerus fracture example which i showed with a fracture gap the tissue healed well and the moment we reduced that fracture gap but did not abolish it had we abolished that fracture gap the strain would have been almost 1 or 2% and bone would have formed directly across the fracture gap but because we left a gap there was micro motion and there was high stress on the healing tissue so one of the things is uh, not to confuse uh, stress and strain okay when you're talking about strain you're talking about the deformation that occurs either in the bone or in the implant at that's when your stress is the forces acting in that area so there are two different mm -hmm. so they have asked that whatever you have already explained about stress strain and young's modulus of elasticity i think thrice in the dnb okay. so uh, already you have uh, shown the graph also on the diagram so little bit more about young's modulus of elasticity sir if they need to write yes so if young's modulus of elasticity city is essentially stress over strain stress over strain is the slope of the graph which i had shown so that is a measure of the stiffness of the implant and as you saw the graph it went up then it suddenly came down and then after some time the line stopped and broke so the point where it breaks off that is known as the strength of the material but the moment its shape changes that is in the plastic zone so the stiffness the modulus of elasticity is a measure of the stiffness of the material so it great it is a measure much. of stiffness think, uh, within no a certain questions. pardon yes sir sir is answering sir so, oh sorry you are still answering oh, a question yes sir so all materials are a little bit elastic in narrow zones so if you take glass it just breaks so it is not elastic very it is elastic but not tight so you see in the modulus of elasticity glass or ceramic for that material in thr it if it falls it cracks titanium and stainless steel balance out the are the ideal implants for fracture fixation because their modulus of elasticity is much much higher than that of healing bone they have reasonable strength to protect the bone from uh fractured bone from uh, abnormal stresses and strain but 
they have to eventually share load with the bone. They can't take the load permanently. So they have to allow the bone to heal. So if you see the stiffness of titanium is half that of stainless steel. So a titanium implant helps in a little more deformation of healing bone. So the concept of MIPO plating with titanium is much better compared to stainless steel. Stainless steel is very stiff, so it does not allow healing bone to deform. So that was the challenge faced in distal femur fractures fixed with stainless steel plates. So now the concept is evolving how to reduce the stiffness with a stainless steel plate. So CERN would know more about this, the concept of far locking screws. I have no personal experience, but now the screws don't lock near the near cortex of the plate. They lock only in the far cortex so that the near cortex also has a little bit of strain to allow favorable bone healing. Yeah, the far cortical locking has still not become widely used. It's, it's used in very limited, uh, this thing in the particular implant that was uh, at one time going to be available in India, but then they withdrew it from the market. And the other uh, thing that Synthes was trying to develop, which was the dynamic locking screw where this thing moved within the outer shell, uh, that failed some of the biomechanical tests, so they didn't bring it to the market. So I think we don't have a very good option for far cortical locking available with us. There is uh, some people are, uh, sort of make improvise on it by over drilling the near cortex so that the screw is locking only on the plate and in the far cortex. But we, we you really don't know what the actual effect of that is in terms of uh, the actual uh, load uh, changes, etc. So no one's actually done work on that or people have done work on that, but it's not very clear yet. So I think uh, we will have to still wait on that. <laughs> so they have changed the implant uh, sort of characteristics by reducing the number of holes in the fracture site area covering the fracture, et cetera. That's happening, but again, not yet widely available. So we'll have to wait for that to happen before we can really talk about it in more detail. Okay, I think- uh, 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 Just one thing, sir. One question in the chat box, which has not yet answered. Although okay. uh, there is one question, how titanium implant are better than SS implant? That is already answered by sir. Uh, also, uh, what he has confused with that sir has explained on plating side there is more callus uh, that line uh, he want to know on plating that, yes sir on in, pla in plating yeah. in yes sir plating, what yeah in plating there is asymmetrical strain across the width of the fracture near the plate there is no deformation of healing tissue or very negligible but on the opposite cortex there is lot of deformation so i think your uh, sound is getting lot of deformation granulation tissue deformation their cartilage will form right so when there is there is asymmetrical strain across the width of the fracture when their plating is done. When a nailing is done, the nail is inside the bone. So the stress, strain and stresses are equally distributed around the diameter of the bone. With the plate, the stresses are more on the other side. So that is why concepts have come of trying to put a plate on the other side of distal femur or put a nail or something else. So the stresses are more on the side opposite the plate. So when stresses are high there, the so strain is also high because there is more movement. When there is more movement, the tissue that will form there is granulation tissue. In the center of the bone where the stresses are lower, their cartilage will form and that will eventually go on to heal and become bone. And where there is bone under the plate, their bone will form. 
so bone forms closer to the plate cartilage in the center and granulation tissue away but the stresses are high maximum away from the plate so with plating and with stainless steel plates which are very stiff this asymmetrical kind of bone formation causes lot of delayed healing and there were challenges and the failure rate in distal fracture fixation still remains very high worldwide so this concept has to be understood this gold principle of how much relative stability does a fracture need that is a question which we still are awaiting an answer from and experience has taught us that surgeons like mukhopadhyay sir mukesh jain <laughs> sir can intuitively apply it to the patient's fracture intuition comes from experience but the gold standard answer mathematically and physically on pen and paper that is there are five fragments with 6 cm length and 12 hole plate mathematically calculate this should be the fracture gap and then we don't have that answer yet true uh, but i think some of it is luck more than intuition but <laughs> look at that but okay thank you very much uh, i think uh, we need to close that today uh, th that was great ritab as usual and thank you. Uh, thank you very much for being part of this program and thank uh, you for the opportunity sir uh, welcome and uh, until next week bye to everybody we'll see you again next week bye thank you very much sir thank you thank you great sir thank you sir i need to go back into the ot <laughs> thank you sir